Hi there, and welcome to another video. This video is a little bit more about theory than it is code. It is another Swift Concurrency video, and if you've been enjoying my concurrency content, make sure to subscribe to the channel and like the video so that I know to make more of these. If you want to educate yourself or your team on Swift Concurrency, I also recommend my book, Practical Swift Concurrency, as well as my course and my workshops. All of those will be linked down in the description. So today I would like to talk a little bit about approaching a migration towards Swift 6. I'm finding that more and more people are asking me about these kinds of topics, and also more and more people are running into mistakes and pitfalls that I think are somewhat avoidable but not entirely. So let's dig right into it. Let's explore this topic and I will give you some of my tips, tricks, hints, and advices around Swift 6. So before you attempt a migration like this, you really want to make sure that you understand where you're at. So you want to take inventory of your code base. And what I mean by that is that you really want to make sure that you know where your code is at. You know whether your code is full of depth, you know whether or not you're modularized, you know how big your code base is, you kind of want to develop a sense for what the code looks like from a refactoring and migration perspective. And while you're doing that, I mainly want you to think about threading because a lot of your code today, if you're not using Swift Concurrency at all yet, is probably running on the main thread. And that is a good thing. But I want you to be aware of that and I want you to be aware of the places in your code that are going to be on main and the places that are absolutely not going to be on main. So really look for those places where you're explicitly leaving the main thread uh, because you're going to want to keep it that way and more on that later on. But this is really important that you understand your code base well and that you have a good sense for concurrency in your code base because Let's be honest, we're probably all using some dispatch group or dispatch queue features, and we're not even fully aware of that. So you want to make sure that you are aware of this. And there's also a very human aspect to a migration like this. So you want to make sure that you know where your team is at. Are they comfortable with concurrency yet? How much do they know about concurrency and how much do they still have to learn about concurrency? These are all essential things for you to know before you attempt to migrate. Because if you migrate without knowing these things, you're almost certainly going to end up with a big, big mess on your hand because nobody understands what they're doing, nobody agrees on how things work, and you're going to end up in a not so good place. So in addition to you know, knowing where your code is and, and knowing where your team is at, you're going to want to think about modularizing your code base before you start. One of the cool things about Swift Concurrency is that you can adopt it on a module by module basis. So when you have a modularized code base, it is so much easier to migrate that over time. You can take one package at a time, you can, take, you can grab low hanging fruits, and it really helps you become comfortable with Swift Concurrency in smaller isolated cases, rather than trying to migrate a whole app. Because what you'll find is once you start migrating, you sort of reach points of no return every once in a while where you made this function async. So now the caller needs to be async, it's caller needs to be async, and it sort of ripples through. And you want to avoid the size of these ripples as much as you can. And modularizing helps with that. Um, you can also use pre-concurrency. So if you're adopting strict concurrency or Swift 6 in one package, and it's complaining about problems coming in from another package, you don't have to migrate the other package. You can use the pre-concurrency annotation where relevant to make sure that you can keep moving and don't get slowed down by things like non-sendable models in other packages. So pre-concurrency can really be a blessing there. Once you've got a sense of where you're at, once you've thought about modularizing, you decided to do it, to not do it, or you're already there, and now is the time to start turning on strict concurrency checks. And I would enable those for one module at a time. And strict concurrency checking really means that the compiler is going to take a close look at your code and it's going to pretend that it's in the Swift 6 language mode, but it's not. It's still in Swift 5 mode and it's going to give you warnings for a lot of things that will be errors down the line. 
So this is a great way for you to get a sense of where is my code at, how many problems do I have, and how many problems do I need to solve. Once you start solving problems, you really want to make sure that you understand the warnings. Every time you see a warning and you're not exactly sure what it means, but you know that applying main actor is going to fix the problem, you probably do want to take a step back and try and understand why does applying main actor fix the problem. Because Swift Concurrency is making some assumption about your code, and it's actually able to prove that assumption as a compiler, and you don't agree with it or you're not exactly sure how it landed on that conclusion. So you want to make sure that you understand why does the compiler say that this is used in, let's say, multiple isolation contexts. Understand that and then fix it. Don't just apply main actor everywhere. It is quite likely though that applying main actor is the solution you're looking for, as we'll see in a moment, but yeah, you don't want to just blindly do that. You want to understand your warnings and then fix them properly because there's also going to be cases where you know how to fix this in a quick way, but it changes a lot of things about how your code runs. That may or may not be intentional, that may or may not be desirable. If that isn't desirable, you want to make sure that you fix it differently. If it is desirable, take the shortest path to a happy compiler, because why make things more complicated than they need to be? One thing that I see a lot of companies do is they take their team and then they select a couple of people, usually more senior developers, and they say, you three, four, five, go and figure out whether it makes sense for us to adopt Swift Concurrency. These people go and do that. They have their project for a couple of weeks and they come back and they say, yes, we should totally do that. So then they come up with a little bit of a plan. They present that to the team and now the team is expected to implement that plan. If you're attempting to migrate without studying, that isn't a good idea. And even though you had a couple of people that studied, you should really make sure that everybody is trained because you really cannot expect a group of five people to study for a couple of weeks and then to just tell everybody else to go and do that. These other people, they might learn well on the job, but they will miss a lot of new ones. So you want to make sure that everybody on the team has the knowledge that they need. You can either do that by having your task force present to the team and teach them what they need to know. Or you can use external resources like mine to train the team. Things like workshops, books, courses, or whatever you can get your hands on is a really good way to train the team, right? Even if you already have your, your couple of people that know everything that they need to know, bringing in external voices, bringing in somebody that can really put everybody on the same level be it through a book, be it through a course, be it through a workshop, whatever you prefer, is a very, very useful. Because it makes sure that everybody knows the same stuff and it makes sure that everybody can have a good conversation. Uh, and also that everybody can make educated choices about how they're introducing concurrency. So anytime you're doing a big project, same applies for SwiftUI or whatever, don't just have a couple people suck up all the knowledge and then just tell everybody else to do it. Make sure that everybody is on the same level when you start the migration. Now, once you've done all this, you're going to determine your approach. I've told you a little bit about, you know, modularization, study and all of these things, but you also want to make sure that you actually determine how you're approaching the migration itself. You could migrate from a random spot in your code base. You could migrate from a random package. I like to migrate from the outside in. What I mean by that is I can migrate networking code and all of these things first and then work my way to the views. You can also do it the other way around, right? It's a matter of experimenting and trying it out and uh, deciding your approach really. Outside in also works well because typically your packages sit more towards the outside and the closer to the app you get, the heavier the package becomes. Um, you want to apply main actor probably to a bunch of stuff right now. This ties back to what I said all the way at the beginning of this video, where if you start analyzing your code base, think about where things run. They probably run on the main actor a lot, and you want to keep it that way. Uh, the reason you want to keep it that way is less concurrency is generally better. Uh, introducing concurrency in a code base means that you're opening yourself up to data races and if the compiler sees data races it's going to complain a lot and really for apps a lot of your code should i think be on the main actor anyway 
Apple is also working on some proposals to essentially put a lot of your code on main actor by default, either by making it the default or having asynchronous functions inherit the actor that they were called from, which is not the case today. So if you don't apply main actor to your functions now, essentially Swift is going to do it for you. And trust me, it makes things a lot easier. Yes, it feels a little bit weird to explicitly put all your work on the main actor, but it is supposed to be there, right? It's, it's where it was in the first place and keeping it there simply makes your code simpler. It makes it so much simpler. Concurrency is really hard and you don't want to introduce tons of it unless it's actually highly intentional. So there are pitfalls, caveats, and dangers in moving towards Swift 6. And one of those is that you might have already introduced too much concurrency unintentionally. If you've started adopting async functions, you didn't annotate them with main actor, you turn on strict concurrency, now you have a ton of warnings about things existing in multiple isolation contexts. Make sure you understand the warning, make sure you understand whether or not this was intentional, and if it wasn't intentional, probably just apply main actor to it so that it all runs on main where it used to run before anyway. Right? That's the key part here every single time. It's, it wasn't the main actor before you moved to Swift concurrency. There's no reason to pull it off of main now. Um, when you adopt Swift concurrency, you're also going to find that not all of Apple's code works really well with Swift concurrency. So you might have to implement some workarounds there. There's nothing you can do about it. It's something we just have to accept for the time being. Um, and also just in general, you might want to hold off on Swift 6 for a while. Uh, Swift 6 is cool. Swift concurrency is really cool. I do enjoy working with it, but migrating to Swift 6 full on is pretty complicated for a lot of projects. If you find that you're just running into a ton of different problems, migrate what you can. If you're modularized, you should be able to migrate some of your modules but maybe your app target is not ready to go to Swift 6 because it's interacting with some Apple frameworks that just aren't ready. Apple is working on these things, so over time they will be ready, but yeah, there's really no point in trying to force it right now. Apple isn't going to take away the Swift 5 language mode anytime soon, so we're not in a rush to go to Swift 6. Do what you can, but don't jump through hoops. You, you, you have your time, right? You can spend your time better than that. So, that's my tips for migrating to Swift 6. I hope this is useful for you. This is all based on experiences from workshops and training teams and migrating my own projects. Um, and it's, it's fun, but it's not easy. So hopefully this video helps you make some decisions. And if there's anything I can do to help you, you can always ask me. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe and like it on YouTube as well so that the algorithm knows that you enjoyed it. And I would like to thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.